In this short video, we're going to introduce triple integrals. So we can easily extend our definition of the double integral to functions of three or even more variables. For functions of three variables, we can define the triple integral over our box. So here, this means x is between a and b y is between c and d, and z is between r and s, has the following limit of a sum. So our triple integral over the box b of f of x comma y comma z dv is the limit of this sum. And we can evaluate that as an iterated integral just like we did with double integrals, but now we have three integrals instead of two. So here's an example. We have the box where x goes from 0 to 1, y goes from 0 to 2, z goes from 1 to 2, and our integrand is yz plus x squared. And then our differential here is a volume differential, d v. So we write it as an iterated integral. Now, just like with double integrals, when you have constants for your bounds of integration, really uh, the order does not matter. So I just went in alphabetical order, dx, dy, dz. But we could have gone in any uh, number, six different ways, actually. So let's go ahead and find the antiderivative with respect to x, evaluate that between 0 and 1. Next, we find the antiderivative with respect to y, evaluate that between 0 and 2. And finally, we're left with finding the antiderivative with respect to z, and evaluating that from 1 to 2. Now, over a general bounded solid, so something more general than a box, it's really very challenging, just like it is with a general region with a double integral, to find the value of the integral. However, there are three important cases where it may be feasible to calculate the antiderivative and evaluate the integral. Uh, if you have a solid where the top and bottom surfaces are functions of x and y, or you have a solid where the left and right surfaces are functions of y and z, or if you have a solid where the front and back surfaces are functions of x and z, then it may be possible to evaluate the triple integral. And let's look at how we would do that. So I'm calling these type 1, type 2, type 3, I honestly don't know if my definitions agree with the textbook or other authors, uh, but it doesn't really matter whether we call it type 1, type 2, or type 3. What matters is that we have a top surface and a bottom surface. And so our solid then is only defined over uh, this particular region D. And for those values in D, z is between the top and the bottom surface. And d is what we call the projection of e onto the xy plane. What does that mean? Well, in this case, if you were looking straight down the z axis at this solid, what region would you see? That would be the projection of d onto the xy plane. Then we would evaluate the triple integral by first evaluating our a single integral with respect to z, whose bounds are the equations for the top surface and the bottom surface. Once we've finished that, we'll have a new integrand which no longer has z in it only x and y. And so then we can evaluate a double integral in x and y.
And we really want to emphasize that we should think of this as having an inner single integral and the outer integral is a double integral. We don't want to write it uh, in our first step as three uh, iterated integrals. Uh, first of all, that might be uh, very challenging. And second of all, it may make sense uh, for the outer double integral to use polar coordinates or to use different techniques. And so we want to leave that option open. Once we finish the inner integral, we see what the integrand looks like. We know what the bounds are. Then we could decide, do we want to use polar coordinates? Do we want to do something else? Or do we want to use it? Think of D as a type one region, as a type two region. How do we want to proceed? So here's an example. And let's walk through this step by step. We have uh, the triple integral of sine of y dv, and e is the solid below the plane, z equals x, and above the triangle with the vertices, the origin, pi comma zero, zero, and zero comma pi comma zero. So it's a little challenging to sketch this. It is what we call a tetrahedron or a triangular pyramid all of the faces are uh, triangles. So we have the base is this triangle as described um, in the question with vertices, the origin at pi zero zero and zero pi zero. And then this portion right here, try to sketch it in here. This sliver of a triangle that we can see is really the portion of the plane uh, z equals x. So since that is z equals x, and I could actually say what the coordinates are of this point, because I know the x coordinate is pi, and the z coordinate will also be pi, and the y coordinate is zero. So this tip right here is pi zero pi. We really don't need to know that information to evaluate the integral, but it's nice to understand, well, what does this shape look like? What is this solid E? Now, mind you, this triple integral has an integrand of sine y. So we're not really calculating the volume of this um, solid here. We're just using every point in the solid uh, as a potential sample point to help us evaluate this. So in addition to having an idea of what the solid looks like, in order to evaluate this, I need to know, if I'm going to think of this as having a top and a bottom, I need to know, all right, what is the projection on the xy plane? Well, what they really tell us here is going to be a triangle with those given vertices. This top line right here then would be y equals pi minus x. All right, so our top surface. Top surface is uh, the plane, z equals x. Bottom surface, well, it's the xy plane, z equals zero. And the fact that I have a top and a bottom, that I'm bounding z between x and zero, tells me that the innermost integral is going to be dz. So like I said, it's probably not worth memorizing, oh, is this type one, type two? What, is, what do those uh, formulas look like? Uh, let's just develop more of a system. Oh, if I'm bounding z, then the innermost integral will be dz. And my bounds will be from z equals zero to z equals x. Now, in this case, there is no z in the integrand. Uh, so uh, sine of y will just be a constant. So when I evaluate that, I would just have, well, x sine y minus zero sine y. Um, right, like I said, the antiderivative would just be z sine y evaluated between zero and x. So I just get x times sine y over this region. 
So I think I want to look at this as being a having a top curve and a bottom curve. The top curve is y equals pi minus x. The bottom curve is y equals 0. So that means dy now has to be on the, the inner integral. And then x goes from 0 to pi in my outer integral. So take the antiderivative with respect to y. Now just give me minus x cosine y. I'll evaluate that between 0 and uh, pi minus x. The 0 doesn't make any contribution. But then I'll have x times cosine of pi minus x. Um, and you can either just look at the inner circle, or you can use the addition formula for cosine. But you can reduce cosine of pi minus x as a negative cosine of x. You could also just make a u substitution here, too, and work it out from, from using the u substitution. But I find that using this identity um, makes the integrand simple enough. So now uh, I can factor out the x. I now have a positive x in front of the cosine. I still need to use integration by parts here. Um, so u will equal x dv is cosine of x plus 1. And we can work it out this way. So we have a lot of options here. I could have broken this up into two integrals. Even at this stage, break it up into two integrals. Um, they all bring you to the same result. And so now uh, let's finish the integration by parts and evaluate between 0 and pi. And we wind up with 1 half pi squared minus 2. All right, let's look when we have a right and a left surface. So right and a left surface, that means we've got y is between these two surfaces, the y value. So y is between the, on the, the right, you have u2. On the left, you have u1. And again, it's defined for all values x and z in a region d. That's got to be now in the xz plane. So the way we would evaluate this is that, well, now we're going to do our single integral with respect to y. The bounds of integration are going to be the left and the right surfaces, left on the bottom, right on the top. And then we'll work out a double integral. So let's look at an example where we think of this as having a left surface and a right surface. So here we have um, the triple integral of xz over a tetrahedron. Remember, a tetrahedron is a triangular pyramid. It has four faces, all of them triangles. And so we're given the vertices. And so really it is helpful at this point to at least make a sketch. And I realized that uh, you know, this can be a little bit uh, challenging to visualize. When you first look at this, it looks kind of like a kite or something like that. But really uh, what we're trying to, to see here is that there is a top triangle right here. Let me do this with a straight line. So we have a top triangle. Right there. And then you have like a vertex which sits at the origin. So this is like a little triangular magic cable that manages the balance on one point right there. So if I look at what is the projection now in the xz plane. So xz plane, I should be more careful about labeling my axes. This is e, this is x, and this is y. So the xz plane, that would be this triangle right here. And so 
what do we have? It's this blue triangle, which goes from, well, the origin up to 0, 0, 1. When I look in the xz plane, uh, you know, there is no y coordinate. And so um, if I just remove the middle coordinate here from these points, I know that I have to go from 0, 0 to 0, 1 and then out to 1, 1. Those are the vertices of the triangle in the xz plane. All right. So my right surface then is actually this slanting triangle, which is coming out from uh, the origin up to this line right here. So that's the plane passing through the points 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 1. Um, passes through the origin. So if we think of this as being AX plus BY plus CZ equals D, um, if it passes through the origin, D has to equal 0. And then just fitting that equation to these uh, other two points leads me to x plus y minus z equals zero. And so I'll have to solve that for y. y equals z minus x. And that's on my right. Uh, on the left, uh, I just have the uh, xz plane, which is the plane y equals zero. So y is bounded between 0 and z minus x. And so since we're bounding y, the innermost integral has to be dy. So I have a dy integral. Lower bound is 0. Upper bound is z minus x. And I need to take the antiderivative with respect to y. Evaluate that between 0 and z minus x. I'll get a polynomial with only x and z. So I'll have x times z squared minus uh, x squared z over this region here. And I think I went ahead and thought about this as having a top curve and a bottom curve as well. So my bottom curve is z equals x. The top curve is z equals 1. So then I must perform the inner integration with respect to z and the outer integration with respect to x. And x goes from 0 to 1 again. So now it's pretty straightforward. We'll anti-differentiate with respect to z. Evaluate that between 1 and x. And collect some like terms here. And then anti-differentiate with respect to x, and evaluate that between 0 and 1. And if I did all the arithmetic correctly, then you can see that um, when x equals 0, there's no contribution. When x equals 1, I get negative 1, 6 plus 1, 6. So yeah, that's pretty simple arithmetic. The answer is going to be 1 over 30. And the last type we want to look at are solids, which have a front surface and a back surface. So x, in this case, is going to be bounded between these two surfaces. And we're looking at points in the yz plane. And again, we'll do an inner integral with respect to x with bounds being the uh, front and rear, so the front on top and the rear at the back, and then do a double integral. So here we're going to evaluate uh, yz dv over the solid, which is a paraboloid capped off by a plane or cut off by a plane. So we're going to have a paraboloid, and then we're going to cut it right here when x equals 9. So there's actually a solid disk here that uh, I, I didn't draw 
I suppose I could go ahead and shade that in to demonstrate that really right here. And you can hardly see what I'm doing. Hmm. Oh, you get the idea. There is a disc capping off that bit of uh, parabola. And so our front surface is that disk, uh, but really that's just a portion of the plane, x equals 9. And the back is the paraboloid. So to figure out what the projection will be, um, oh yeah, let's just note first of all that now the innermost integral is going to have to be dx. And what is D? Well, I should have shown a little bit more work here. What am I doing here? So I'm saying that, oh, if I have 9y squared plus 9z squared, that's the rear surface, equals 9, which is the front surface, then I can divide everything by 9. And that's how I get y squared plus z squared equals 1. All right, so let's evaluate the triple integral. So our innermost integral has lower bounds. The rear surface is the paraboloid. Upper bound 9, because that's the plane. And I differentiate with respect to x. And go ahead and evaluate that. So now let's take a look at this integrand. My D is a disk. That is a polar region. In my integrand, I have a 1 minus y squared minus z squared. And my disk is y squared plus z squared equals 1. So it looks like using polar would be a good choice. Now we're used to using x and y with polar, but there's no reason we can't use y and z or x and z. So here I'll just use the substitution y equals r cosine theta, z equals r sine theta, and y squared plus z squared then will be r squared. And this disk in the yz plane would be the region where r goes from 0 to 1 and uh, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. So I've got this 9, which I've uh, factored out in front. Um, replacing x and y, I'll get my r squared sine theta cosine theta. Inside the parentheses, I have 1 minus r squared. And then my dA is still going to be r dr d theta. All right, so if I multiply all those r's out, I'll have sine theta, cosine theta outside the parentheses. Inside the parentheses, I'll have r cubed uh, minus r to the fifth. So I'm going to go ahead and take that antiderivative and evaluate that between 0 and 1. So that just winds up being, what, 1 fourth minus 1 6, which is 1 12th. And I'll bring that out in front. So now I have 9 over 12. And I can make an, any number of uh, substitutions here, or either use substitution or use an identity. In the end, I'll get the same value. So I'm just going to say that, oh, uh, u equals sine theta, du is cosine theta, d theta. So the antiderivative would be 1 half sine squared theta, and I've reduced 9 twelfths to 3 fourths. Evaluate that between 0 and 2 pi. Well, sine of 0 is the same as sine of 2 pi, which is all 0. So the volume, I mean, sorry, the value of this integral is 0. And so uh, you may say to yourself, is there any shortcut I could have used to just say right away that this is going to be zero? 
um, I wouldn't call it a shortcut. There is some analysis that you can perform to say that for every uh, X, Y, and Z in this solid, there is another point which uh, yields a positive value of Y, Z. There is a corresponding point uh, where you'll get a negative value. And, um, and once you know it's zero, you can kind of think to yourself, oh yeah, this is going to make sense because yz is going to be positive uh, when either y and z are both positive or both negative. And when either one is uh, negative, then the, it'll be positive. So uh, it kind of makes sense. But to show that rigorously would be a, a little bit of work. It'd take a little bit of work. And so I'm going to stop this video here, and I'm going to make a separate video where we talk about some properties of the triple, triple integral.